For those of you who've been watching the channel for a while, you'll know that January is always my month for shop infrastructure. This dates back to when I had a bunch of clients and they always got really quiet after the holidays. I was always so worried that I wouldn't have work in the new year, but the clients end up coming back in February, March, and so I used January to just assess what's working, what's not, what can I organize just to make the rest of the year better. If you remember last year, I did this tool wall and I love it. It has been super handy. It's just really nice to look at, uh, but it's also super functional. And in that video, I promised that I would do a second part where I take care of the other half of the tool wall and I didn't do that. So as you can see, the other half of the tool wall is largely unchanged since I started making YouTube videos. I brought over my old miter saw station from my old shop, and this is the miter saw that, it's like the first tool I ever owned. I bought this off of Craigslist. It is deadly straight, it cuts a great 45, and um, I, I, I love using it, I just have totally outgrown it. So I made a major upgrade, and with that upgrade means that I need to rebuild this station, which is honestly a good thing because now I can integrate stop blocks and dust collection. I'm super excited to finally do this build and start the new year right. So these are the oldest cabinets in my shop. Quick tour of my old construction methods out of all sorts of scrap materials. Little cheap hardware store hinges. The best part is that this is my first drawer. So the first time that I made a drawer, I made it like this. What? Like, I don't even know how I came up with this craziness. What? So that's your drawer stop there. It's got like two sliders. Like runners against other runners with a stop block back there. And this is like legit embarrassing. There's just so much garbage in here. Um, never buy one of these. Just some uh, roll of tin foil. Just so much stuff. And I don't need any of it. I've just been stuffing it in here forever. I spent a few hours cleaning up, removing the old cabinets, and then decided to go ahead and repaint this wall. I'm gonna put a new tool wall up, but that will be in a later video. One of the big issues that I had with those cabinets is that they weren't perfectly level to each other. They were independent, so uh, they, they would shift around a little bit here and there. And I wanna make sure that this new miter station is dead level. So I'm starting the project off by building a simple toe kick. This is the sort of thing that you would build for kitchen cabinets. And this will allow me to level on the floor first and then build everything up off of a level surface, as opposed to trying to build perfectly level cabinets to these floors. The nice thing about this is that if I ever move shops, the only thing that I would have to rebuild is this toe kick and then the rest of the cabinets can travel with me. Once I have the outer frame built, I can start reinforcing the structure with some cross braces. These are set at 16 inches on center and I just use a couple of spacer blocks to make sure that they're evenly distributed throughout the toe kick. This miter station is going to be about 12 feet long and the toe kick section is about 10 and a half feet. And the plywood that I'm working with is only eight feet long. So I had to make an extra little section to screw onto the end just to add that little extra bit of length. With that assembled, I could slide it into place and see how well it fits. Now you notice at this point, it's not level, it actually has a big rock to it, and that's because the floor isn't level. So I need to level this up on the floor, and for that I'm just gonna add some handy shims until it is level, then after that I can come back with some blocks and screw them into place to support the areas that don't have support from underneath. 
Now you could of course scribe this to the floor if you really wanted to spend time on that, but in this case, it's just not necessary. Instead, I just took some scrap pieces of that plywood that I cut for the rest of the toe kick, cut it down to small blocks, and then I could use those blocks to screw into the corners and support any areas that didn't have support from underneath. Once done, I can remove those handy shims and now it is perfectly level and I can build my cabinets off of that foundation. So I'm gonna be working with Baltic birch plywood on this and I know that a lot of people are gonna be asking me where I got it. Currently, it's kind of hard to get in the United States and I am not sure when that's gonna change. I don't have any special access to Baltic birch plywood. Honestly, I'm, I'm hoping some sort of manufacturer comes out with an alternative uh, soon, but for now I have a lot in inventory and I plan on keeping this miter station for hopefully the rest of my career. Um, so I, I wanted to build it out of good materials, which these I already had in the shop. So I decided with this design to start from the center and work my way out. I'm starting with the center cabinet that is going to support the miter saw. Now, you may be looking at this being like, Michael's just building the same thing that he had before, uh, but the amount of storage and the capabilities of this miter station is gonna be so wildly different. Although I don't really mind the old workflow. I honestly thought that the old cabinets worked really well. So um, I'm sort of just making a nicer version of the, the miter station that I had before. So you'll notice on these top sections, these cross braces, they're just made with the leftover scrap uh, from cutting down the plywood. I don't need a lot of material here. I just want to hold it together until I can get a, an actual top on it. And this is a great way to save on material while still building a solid carcass. I'm also gluing on a quarter inch back panel. This is going to strengthen it quite a bit and it also helps me square it up. I can see if it's out of square and use a clamp to, to true it up because I know that that back panel is square. Anything that looks off, I can just kind of shift the cabinet into 90 degrees. And with that, the first carcass is ready to set on top of that toe kick. So the reason why I started from the center cabinet out is so that I could lay a bottom panel down on the toe kick, put the capex, the new miter saw onto the center stand and take a real measurement off of it so that I make sure that it's aligned perfectly with the out feed of the capex. After that, I can cut the side panels of both the left and right cabinet to the size that I just measured. You'll notice the majority of the joinery in these cabinets is pocket holes, and that's just because they're quick and easy and plenty strong enough for this application. Some of the pocket holes, because this is an outside panel, are gonna get oriented to the inside. You're not gonna see the inside of this cabinet because it is full of drawers. The other side is oriented the opposite way, just because it's actually stronger to orient them inward towards the panel. For the top of the cabinet, it's the same thing as the middle cabinet. I just used some of the scrap pieces and pocket hold them into the sides. For the back panel, I didn't want to break into a whole new sheet. So use the remainder of the scrap from the first sheet. And then patch the bottom with a bit of scrap. I'm excited to have Jackery back to sponsor this build. For those who don't know, Jackery makes these amazing portable solar generators. For the last few months, I've been testing out the Jackery Explorer 1000, and I love it. Here in the Northwest, I spend a lot of time outside camping and exploring, and Jackery makes products designed for an outdoor lifestyle. 
At one of my favorite local beaches, I put my Jackery to the test on the devices that I'd like to bring camping with me. On this trip, I brought my electric kettle and the Jackery had no problem generating enough power to heat up the full pot using a standard AC plug. The water heated up in three minutes and I had a hot cup of tea to keep me warm on this January day. All Jackery generators have both AC and DC power, so I can heat up water while at the same time charge my cell phone or any other USB device. Next, I decided to go down the beach with the generator to see if I could do some power carving. That's right, I brought a Dremel with me. I honestly didn't know if this would work, but the Jackery was able to power it at full speed. I might have to do a video in the future where I make some carvings in remote locations. The other cool thing about Jackery generators is that they can be recharged using solar power. They're easy to carry 100 watt solar panels, have built in handles and kickstands, so you can just lay them out and recharge your generator with the power of the sun. Jackery generators provide reliable power whether you are out in the woods or use it as backup when the electricity goes out. Jackery just released their newest solar generator, the Jackery 1500 Pro, and if you pre-order now, you get 15% off. Also, through February 15th, they are offering up to 30% off a whole bunch of their products, so check out jackery.com to warm up your winter with Jackery Solar. Thanks, Jackery. Now back to the build. Now the right cabinet is exactly the same dimensions as the left cabinet, so I cut the side panels at the same time, but it is gonna be used very differently. The left side will be all drawers, the right side is actually gonna have a flip top lathe in it. If you guys saw my Instagram stories, you would have seen this in action. I'm gonna actually show you it working at the very end of this video, but it turned out to be a much more complex build. So I decided in order to cover it completely, I'm gonna be putting that in a separate video. So um, look forward to that. That'll probably come out in a week. It's already shot, it's already built, it works great. So this is just a little bit of a teaser. One thing that I did have to do was make sure that it was a stronger cabinet than the left side cabinet. So I did wrap it in these panels and they're gonna function not only to strengthen the cabinet, they will also allow me to store some lumber under there to use with the lathe. So don't worry, within a week or so, I will have another video out covering this flip top lathe. lathe. It's super cool, it was a really fun build. I'm looking forward to sharing it. But for now, let's get back to the cabinetry on the miter station. And as you can see, that toe kick is working out great. I didn't have to do any leveling after this point. It is perfectly level and uh, it's just so much nicer than the old cabinets. With the three carcasses in place in their final homes, I can start screwing them in so that they're locked together and are one solid mass. One thing that I discovered when I uh, pulled away the old cabinets is that I had a, an outlet back here. I didn't even know that that was there and it's a great discovery because I can use that for the new miter saw. One of the ideas for this design is to make all the tops removable. So if anything changes, if uh, they get damaged, I can always swap them out. So they're not glued down, they're just screwed in from below. If I change my miter saw for whatever reason, I can actually shim up these panels and, uh, and so it's slightly adjustable. And speaking of the new miter saw, this is the Festool Capex KS120. Festool is not sponsoring this video. I bought it with my own money, but it's something that I've had my eye on for a really long time. I love its small footprint. I love that it has a lot more capacity. And I also love that it has dust extraction. This is huge for me because my old miter saw was super messy. Now I tried to push the plug through the hole and I immediately realized that I made it too small. So here's a quick tip on how to enlarge a hole with a Forstner bit. I just hammered on a dowel that was the same size as the original hole and then uh, started drilling. That lines it up with the old hole and then you can resize it however you like.
Now that lower cabinet is designed to hold my shop vac. I can put that in and then using this heavy duty shop vacuum hose from Rockler, I can hook it all up. Rockler also sells these universal fittings that fit onto pretty much every tool. I got a pack of them and I found the one that fit correctly. The shop vac that I'm using plugs directly into the wall and then the tool plugs into the shop vac. So when it turns on, it'll automatically start up. The next thing in the build is to make the top. And as you can see, it fits really nice and level to that saw because I designed it for that. And now I wanted to cut this angled piece. If I went with the angle that was on the saw, it looked kind of weird because it didn't end in the right spot. So I sort of fudged that angle a little bit, shifted it towards the cabinetry just so that it'll look a little bit better. With the top removed, I can start laying out for the hidden cubby and some other accessories, some space for the saw to turn. And I also laid out for the T-track that's gonna go in this. So it's gonna be relatively complicated to cut all these parts. For the T-track, I took some time and set up my dado stack. I rarely do this because it takes so much time, but for a panel this large to cut that consistent of a track, it made a lot of sense. To cut out the other bits, I relied on my track saw and a jigsaw to get that work done. The track saw is really nice because you can do plunge cuts and cut into the middle of panels, and the jigsaw just helps to clean up the little bit that's remaining. This little hidden cubby is going to go behind my nail guns because nail guns are only so deep and there's plenty of space back here so i'm going to build a little extra storage space so that i can hide spare hoses and other pneumatic accessories with that panel cut out i made a couple marks to make sure that i knew which way was the grain match and then i could take it over to the table saw and cut this little back bevel this is going to help it open and close without running into itself once the hinge is attached you only really need to shift the blade about five degrees in order for this to work for the hinge, I'm using a piano hinge that I already had in the shop. I just cut it to the length using a hacksaw, and then I can screw it into place. Now I ran into one little issue. The cubby was a little too small, so I searched through all of my hardware bags, and I finally found this 90 degree drill adapter. If you don't have one of these in the shop, I highly recommend picking one up because there are just moments where you have to drill in a, in a small space. This is about $40. I'll post a link down below. This DeWalt one is the best one that I've found. Just a couple more things to do on this top. I drilled a quick hole for the air hose. And then I also made a support to support the right-hand side. This is also gonna allow me to build a set of drawers inside of these little unused spaces to the left and right of the saw. After a few pocket holes, I can flip over that panel and attach it to the bottom. The T-Track that I'm using is also from Rockler and conveniently it's made out of aluminum, which means that I can cut it on the miter saw. When cutting metal, I always just take my time. I don't really chop down on it. I just slowly cut through it because it's better for the blade not to heat up too much. Once I got all that installed, I quickly noticed that the saw didn't fully rotate. I, I didn't take into account this little bit on the back of the saw, and so I needed to remove some material. For that, I've just pulled the panel and used my jigsaw, cut out the lines that I had traced out, and then cleaned up those cuts with a rasp.
Now that everything was fitting well, I could screw it in from underneath. I decided to keep my old rack for my nail guns. Uh, I debated about this for a little bit, just making it again. But there's honestly nothing wrong with it. It fits all the nail guns perfectly. So I'm just reusing that. I did sand it, cleaned it up a little bit. And now I'm going to rebuild the back section because the cubby has changed a little bit. Since the air hose has to go through, I have to make a couple of relief cuts for that. And then I can screw the panels together. Again, everything's put together with pocket holes. So if I need to change anything, I can. And I decided to put a full back panel on it so that uh, it's just clean looking on the inside. I added another through hole at the bottom and then I could screw it onto the back of the nail gun cat. I got this assembly set up and clamped and I screwed it in from the bottom. Now that back edge was kind of leaning down a bit, not a surprise, but I tried a couple things to get it to square up. I added a clamp to the front edge and hit it with a mallet a couple times, but that didn't quite do it. So I cut this temporary strip to go in the back that managed to lift it up high enough so that I could get it screwed in from the inside. So now it's time to work on the doors and drawers. For the drawers, I had a big enough panel so that I can actually make all of them out of one piece. These will be grain matching as a result. And I loaded up the dado stack again. This is an easier way to make all those rabbits. Since I know that they're all gonna be exactly the same, I cut all the rabbits at once. In order to keep that grain match aligned, I drew a couple of lines on the inside and then I could start rip cutting them. I'm gonna have a large bottom drawer and then I'm making up the rest out of four inch tall drawers. I then rip cut all of the sides and those will be the same height as the drawer fronts. Both the sides and the fronts will get a quarter inch rabbit. And for this, I just did two passes with the table saw, shifting the fence over an eighth of an inch each time. Once those were done, I could cut all the backs and then I had all the parts to make all five drawers. This build has been pretty fascinating and wild to just see my growth personally as a woodworker over the last i think i made those original cabinets about eight years ago and uh these drawers are just night and day different from the original ones that i made i found drawers one of the hardest things to learn as a woodworker and if you're interested in learning more about how to make drawers i put together a, a video a, a little over a year ago and I'll, I'll link to it here so if you're interested as a beginner to learn how to make drawers make them better than i used to make them uh, i made the video that i wish had existed when i started woodworking as you can see these drawers just notch together uh, i really like this building method it's very quick um, and uh, it, it's got great results. I've, I've built drawers like this for a long time and they've lasted. Uh, you will notice that the back panel is pocket holed in, something a little bit different for this build, but essentially the same way as I built them in the original video. Now that those four are assembled, I have to tackle the large drawer. And this one is stupidly complicated because I probably should have just bought shorter drawer slides for this, but uh, the ones that I got from Rockler are uh, the same length. So I built this crazy contraption. Um, don't recommend this on your build, but I, I did make this sort of pocket hole abomination uh, to hold the whole thing together. It worked, it was fine, um, but this just allows enough room so that that plug can sit back there and the cord goes around it. It assembles essentially the same way as the other drawers and ended up working out just fine. To attach the drawer slides, I used a scrap piece of plywood as a spacer block. I like to pre-drill my holes using a self-centering drill bit, and then I can screw in the hardware. It needs about three screws on each side. 
In order to access the third and final hole, you need to remove the outer casing of the slide using this little plastic tab on the inside. And using the same spacer, I just repeat the same thing on the opposing side. The cool thing about this technique is that on the inside of the cabinet, I just use the same spacer, but I put a couple of eighth inch handy shims underneath. This is gonna lift the cabinet up an eighth inch. I want an eighth inch reveal all the way around. So uh, it's just an easy way to get this set up. I do it on both sides, remove the spacer as well as the handy shims, and then I can insert the drawer. What? What are you hitting? I struggled to get this first drawer in, but it turned out the problem was that the right hand runner was not fully engaged. So once I got that fixed, it worked just fine. Oh, that's better. There we go. <laughs> that's so much better. For the smaller drawers, it's a very similar process, except for I turned that same spacer block on its side, and that just gave me a good spacing for it screwed in all three screws, and then on the inside of the cabinet, I can use that spacer block on top of the previous drawer, and then add, again, the eighth inch shims underneath it. After I had everything set up, it was just a matter of repeating on all the remaining drawers. This went super fast. Before closing that top drawer and not being able to access it, I decided to put on these drawer poles. These are super easy to install. They're the same ones that I used on my flat file. Uh, I just got them in black instead of brass. I'll post a link down below to where you can find them. Now that the main bank of drawers is done, I can start working on the doors that are gonna cover up the vacuum. Once cut, I eased over the corners of both doors using a chamfer bit and my router. I used to drill out concealed door hinges on my drill press, measuring them out, and it's a little bit tedious. When I was working on a job, I found this in a hardware store. It's a jig made by Craig, and uh, it makes it so much easier that I've never looked back. You can drill these things out on site. It comes with the right size bit, which even finding the right bit is sometimes hard to find. Highly recommend if you do a lot of cabinet door work. With the holes drilled out, I can now attach the hinges. And for that, I square them up, drill them out, and screw them in. While I had the doors on my workbench, I decided to attach the drawer poles as well. The other element that's a little finicky when installing these doors is putting in the clips, and I use the Rockler Jigget system for that. They have a few different of these jigs depending on the style of hardware you're using. But again, if you are installing a lot of these, it makes sense to invest in a couple of jigs because it just speeds up the process so much. As you can see, I'm already starting to use this miter station and it is super nice. This drawer is made exactly the same as the inset drawers behind me, uh, but it's a full overlay drawer. So the only difference is that it's gonna overlay on the top of the cabinet. So I just made the wings on the side of the drawer face a little bit wider. Installing the runners is very similar too. I just made some bigger spacers, repeated it on both sides, and then installed the drawer. Now 
Now you're probably saying to yourself, Michael, that's great, but where's the pattern plywood? <laughs> Don't worry, it's coming. I've got plans to make some little pattern plywood drawers just as an accent on this whole miter station. In order to do that, I cut a couple pieces with a dado so that it could accept a piece of quarter inch plywood as the bottom. And then I traced out the angles that I needed. I inset the thickness of the pattern plywood, which will be the drawer front. And then I could cut those down on the miter saw. I just eyeballed these angles from the ones that I had drawn, but made sure to use the same angle cut on both pieces. After that, I could reinsert the sides of the drawer and then slot in the quarter inch bottom panel. Then I can use those sides to trace out where I needed to cut the quarter inch panel and then cut that on the miter saw as well. Keeping the angle on the miter saw the same, I can cut this small block for the front piece to act as a glue surface for the pattern plywood. Then it's just a matter of gluing the whole thing together. Off camera, I cut this little block for the backer and I'm insetting it a little bit just as a way to let me know when I pull out the drawer to stop there. If I pull the drawer all the way out, it'll obviously fall and dump out everything inside of it. One of my favorite patterns that I've ever made is this black dragon scale pattern plywood. And I've got a couple of pieces still left over from when I made the bowl a little while back. In order to get this plywood to match up, I'm matching the angle on the front of the drawer. Then I can just use my miter gauge to cut those angles in. For the poles, I'm gonna match the poles that are on the pattern plywood drawers on my tool wall. I drilled a hole in the center of the panel and then I headed over to my metal shop to grab some brass. I just got a rack from the people at KNS Precision Metals. Uh, they came out to interview me. I just wanted to give them a shout out because that interview is about to come out, I think on February 2nd, it goes live and those guys are awesome. They were super nice. They came to just hang out and, and talk about my shop. And um, I really love the edit that they came out with. So uh, Ted and Scott, appreciate you guys coming out. And I also really appreciate having this much metal and brass just to work with on, on my future projects. Thanks guys. I installed the poles with a little bit of epoxy after they were polished up in my drill using a bit of Scotch-Brite. Once the epoxy set up, I applied some glue to the back sides of the pattern plywood and then clamped them onto the drawers. Outside, I applied spray lacquer to both the pattern plywood and the brass. While I waited for the drawer fronts to dry, I worked on the last element of this miter station, which is this bumper that's gonna go right in front of the miter saw. I picked this piece of curly walnut and attached it to the front using dominoes. I made sure to only glue the top edge because again, I want that top to be potentially removable in the future. After that, the only thing that was left to do was to insert a couple drawers and start using it.
I mean, it's hard to be much happier <laughs> than I am with this thing. This station is awesome. For those asking, plans will be made available. Um, I, we're working on them right now behind the scenes. So uh, hopefully by the time the lathe video comes out, plans will be available. Speaking of which, there's a lathe. <laughs> it's just, there's just a lathe in here and it's so easy to put away. You don't want it. Everything lines up perfectly. So that will be the next video. I will be covering how I built this. And uh, in the meantime, I'll probably be applying finish to the top surfaces and everything just to make sure that they hold up for many years to come. Big thank you to Jackery for sponsoring this video. Big thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys are the best and I'll catch you on the next one.